Hello and welcome to another video by Adrian Davey from Pure Electric. In part one of this video, we discussed the Electricity at Work Regulations 1989, how we can comply with that statutory document, and I've shown you what can happen when you receive an electric shock to prove why this simple but effective procedure can keep people safe. This is part two of that video, and I will now talk you through where and how to isolate by showing you with simplified pictures and diagrams to give you the best chance at success, whether that is in your college and AM2 assessments or in a real life environment. I want to start with this flowchart that I've put together to help you understand the thought process for safe isolation. The first thing we do is prove that our test equipment is to GS38 and that it works correctly. If not, then you either replace or service the test equipment and try again. The reason I suggest proving this works first is to minimise the time between seeking permission, isolating the device and proving dead, as this is the point where the process is most vulnerable, as you may have covers off and more things can go wrong. Next, we locate the circuit or equipment to be worked on, as well as the point of installation. The guidance from the best practice guide is to prove that the equipment is actually controlled by the isolation device and not just to assume that this is the case. You can do that by operating light switches or plugging in, plugging in a socket tester. But the best way is to use a circuit finder, like the one pictured here, which costs around £100 inclusive of that. If you come across an unknown circuit, you must assume that the cable is live until proven otherwise, even if it is marked up as dead or not in use. The best practice guide too suggests that a clamp meter can be a means of identifying a cable, but that will only work if current is flowing, so it suggests using cable detection equipment with a signal generator. When we seek permission to isolate, we need to minimise the time between permission being given and the circuit being isolated. If you think about it, what will people start doing if too much time elapses? Well, ultimately, they'll start work. I would suggest giving the responsible person a time of around 10 minutes between asking for permission and the power being cut. This will give you enough time to let people know and make preparations. Obviously, that is site dependent. The bigger the site, the more time that you'll need. Another little tip that I suggest is to offer to get the apprentice to stick the kettle on. And that way, when the tea is ready, everyone comes to a natural stop and you can switch the power off without argument. Once we have permission, we can operate the isolation device and fit our locks and warning labels so that we can safely test. Once the lock and toggle are on, give it a firm tug and wiggle to ensure that no one is able to interfere with your control. I cannot even begin to tell you how many times I've been assessing and I've been able to gently knock the toggle off because it was never on properly in the first place. Don't forget that it's traditionally free test on a single phase circuit and 10 tests on a free phase. A lot of people get caught out when testing a lighting circuit as they forget to operate the switch and test the switch lines. So I've put this in as a step so that you don't forget it. If the circuit is not dead, proceed with extreme caution. You could now be in a very precarious position as you have access to live parts. Carry out a risk assessment, close off the live parts again and repeat the process. Again, I would highly recommend purchasing a circuit finder like the one I showed you before. This will increase your chances of being right and not making a costly or deadly mistake. Well worth the money to look professional and avoid unwanted circuits being isolated. If the circuit was dead, you now need to reprove your voltage indicator. Again, consider this. How would you know if the tester was working properly? Because the circuit was dead, so no LEDs would have lit up. Either that, or your voltage indicator developed a fault while you were using it. And this is what you need to do to prove that it worked one last time. If the device is working, you can begin work. If not, you need to carry out a risk assessment, make safe, and then replace or service your test equipment, possibly even starting the process again. A big problem for a lot of apprentices is where they should actually isolate from. When performing safe isolation, you need to consider what accessory you are isolating and ensure that you are isolating upstream so that you remove any sources of energy as you gain access to live parts and basic insulation within an enclosure. Here, I have drawn up a very basic flow diagram showing the supply coming in from a local transformer, the type that you would find out in the street, perhaps in an enclosure like this one or behind a fence with warning signs posted around the perimeter. Next, we have the service head which houses the main fuse and is usually controlled by the local distribution network operator or DNO. These are usually sealed with a metal crimp to tie to avoid tampering. I've left the electricity meter out for clarity, but this would usually go between the main service head and the consumer unit. If you look at the first few pages of the on-site guide, 
you will see the traditional arrangement. After this, we have a double pole main switch. You need to check whether this can be switched off under load. I will talk about that at the end of this slide. And this then leads to the single pole MCB or RCBO that was protecting the circuit. The appliance is connected to the circuit via an isolator, which in this case is a 13 amp plug, and this socket is only single pole. Although double pole ones exist, and I would highly recommend using one of those. They are more useful having a neutral, which can be isolated when you have a neutral earth fault and the RCD is tripping up. Finally, we have the load which in this case is a washing machine. In order to be able to work on the washing machine for mechanical and electrical maintenance, we need to be able to disconnect the appliance from the supply to prevent accidental energizing. Ideally, this isolation should be local to the appliance to enable low skilled or non-electrical workers to work safely. If I then add in the enclosures for each point, we can start to look at the supply and load side of each point of isolation. Hopefully, once you start to understand this, it will make safe isolation easier for you to understand and the reasons why you isolate upstream when gaining entry to an enclosure. Here we have the supply coming into the enclosure, originating from upstream, and the load coming out of the enclosure and heading downstream to the next enclosure. Just remember the source or supply is always upstream, just like the flow of a river. As we move downstream, what was the load from the previous enclosure is now the supply to the next and the load is always coming out of the enclosure downstream. As this continues, as we move downstream, the supply is upstream and the load is downstream. Same again, supply is upstream, the load is downstream. Finally, we get to the end of the circuit, which is usually the appliance or point of load. Let's imagine that we want to gain access to the load. As the appliance is not working and the socket is, so we want to check the electrical connections. Before we can gain access to live parts, we need to think back to the hierarchy of controls. The most effective method to protect us from a hazard is elimination. The hazard in this instance is electricity, and we can remove that hazard by isolating the supply to the appliance. We need to look upstream to isolate the supply, which means we are looking at the single pole isolator. In this instance, the single socket. We could be thinking that isolating the switch would be sufficient, as this would remove the electrical supply. But what would be stopping someone from operating the switch whilst we were working on the appliance? And it's worth noting that a switch on a socket is not capable of being locked off. So the best option is to unplug the appliance. What's to stop people plugging in the appliance? I hear you cry. Well, that's a good question. Unfortunately, there is an affordable piece of equipment from Martindale on the market for such dilemmas. And it's one of these. They also sell one for the appliance itself and as do master lock. Let's imagine that it's the socket that needs checking or replacing. Again, we need to look upstream from the socket and this brings us to the MCB. We can easily isolate this by operating the switch. But first, what are the hazards? Let's look back at the hierarchy of control. Well, someone else could be using the circuit and or equipment that needs to stay on. So now that we have identified our point of isolation, we need to seek permission to isolate, which is our admin controls. Once this is given, we can now operate the MCB and we can also secure it in the off position by using a lock off toggle like the device shown here. This fulfills the engineering controls and prevents people tampering with your control of the installation. All that's left to do is to prove that the socket has been de-energized because there shouldn't be any supply to the socket terminals that LEDs won't light. So don't forget to prove that your voltage indicator is working correctly first. Otherwise, how would you know? Without this vital step, you will fail with safe isolation as there is a slimmest chance that the power could still be on. The circuit is potentially de-energized and unable to be re-energized due to the lock off on the MCB. We can initially test the socket front by plugging in a socket tester as a further check to test to increase our chances of success before we gain access to the live terminals inside the socket. I recommend buying a socket tester where all the LEDs light up or it has a self test so that you know if one of the LEDs is malfunctioning. Once you are 100% satisfied that you can safely gain entry to live parts, only then can you unscrew the faceplate to test at the terminals with your GS38 approved voltage indicator. It's a good idea to put the test probe onto the earthing conductor first so that you don't have the other end potentially live. So put the probe first on earth 
then test to the line conductor. Remove from the line conductor first, and then still with the probe on the earth, come to the neutral, remove it from both. As the neutral is safer than the line conductor, put one of your test leads on the neutral first, and then bring the test probe to line, to test between neutral and line conductors. Finally, don't forget to prove that your test equipment hasn't malfunctioned during the test. Remember, how would you know if it was working as the LEDs wouldn't have been lit? So you need to prove these again to ensure the circuit is 100% de-energized. Only then are you finally safe to work on this accessory. And the process repeats itself as we work our way through the circuit. With the exception of the consumer units, our main switch, unless there was an external isolator between the electricity meter and the consumer unit main switch, you have no way of isolating the supply from the main service head, at which point you should contact the DNO and ask them to remove the fuse for you. For instance, this will enable you to change the consumer unit safely, and it would probably be worth putting an additional isolator between the meter and the consumer unit for future consumer unit changes before the DNO replaces the fuse. This may not be an option, and you may not be able to isolate the boards in the assessment at college, and particularly it's currently not an option for the AM2. This means that your only option is to go through the safe isolation procedure by seeking permission, the switching off the main switch and locking this off before gaining entry, so that the supply side of the main switch is the only thing that is live, before proving the load side of the switch is dead. It's also worth noting that the guidance from electrical safety first is that single pole devices are not suitable for TT systems or IT system. Multi-pole switching devices capable of isolating line and neutral conductors should be used instead. So next time you're in standing in front of a consumer unit or accessory looking to gain entry to life part, don't forget to seek permission to isolate the supply. Remembering that the main switch could be an isolator and not a switch, meaning that it may not be designed to be turned off under load. In this case, operating each individual circuit to remove the load and working our way to the main switch, we can avoid damaging the main switch. Then secure the main switch in the off position with a suitable lockout kit. Most free phase boards have a red warning sticker beside the board that states isolate main switch before removing cover, and yet they don't have them on a single phase board. I've always wondered why, so if anyone knows the answer, please get in touch. The last thing that I want to talk about is the supply side and load side of the main switch and MCB RCBOs. If we divide the main switch down the middle vertically, you will see that the line coming out of the top is the line coming out of the bottom. The same is for the neutral and demonstrates that the switch is straight through. They do not cross over. Then if we divide the switch in half, Horizontally, you can see that the top of the switch is the supply side in, and the bottom of the switch is the load side out. If we now bring the bus bar in, you will see that the pin coming out of the main switch is the supply to the bus bar, and the pin going into the bottom of the MCB is the line in. This means that the bottom of the MCB is the supply in, and the top is the load out. This should make it easier for you to understand how the switches inside a consumer unit work and then think about where you are going to put your test probes. Because again, if you were testing and you weren't able to isolate the supply to the consumer unit, this supply side would be live. So there's no good testing there and the load side would be dead. Obviously, in assessment situations, there would be no power to the supply side. They would never liven that up for apprentices or people in training. So you'll test at this point, but there won't be any voltage there. So be very, very careful. The best practice guide to issue three also talks about table 53.4, which has now changed for the 18th edition to table 537.4, although the table remains unchanged. As we look down this table, it tells you the device. It tells you the standard. It tells you whether it's suitable for isolation whether it's suitable for emergency switching and whether it's suitable for functional switching. It will also tell you if the device is suitable for isolation, it will be marked with this symbol. If the device is suitable for on-load isolation, i.e. disconnection whilst carrying load, it will also display this symbol. So you're looking for one and three, a main switch 60947-3 says yes. 
but it should display this symbol. So here we have circuit breakers to 60898, uh, RCBO to 61009. And if we look, obviously they're applicable for isolation, emergency switching and functional switching. But the thing I wanna draw your attention to here is that they are primarily circuit protective devices. And as such, they are not intended for frequent load switching. Basically, it suggests here that you should find alternative devices from those listed above. And here, and this is the rest of the table. If safe isolation does not come easy to you, then please take the time to watch my in-depth video on safe isolation. If you search for Adrian Davy AM2 or 2391, carrying out safe isolation, this video will come up. And this video aims to teach the knowledge and understanding behind safe isolation, as well as showing you the simple process of operating a lock off kit. Once you understand the hierarchy of controls and the thought process behind safe isolation, you will not only be able to keep yourself safe, but those around you in almost any situation. Please take the time to follow the hashtag Safer September, which looks to promote safe working practices on site to keep you alive. Most apprentices are not performing safe isolation at work, which at the very least is causing them to fail the AM2 safe isolation assessment. Not only that, but it's putting people's lives at risk. By following and sharing this hashtag, it will help promote a safe culture with which you can flourish in your chosen profession. I will leave you with this final guidance from page eight of the Electrical Safety First Best Practice Guide to issue three. I hope you've enjoyed watching. And if you like this content and want to see more, then please like, share and subscribe to get these important messages out there so that everyone can benefit from them. If we all love and care and take individual responsibility for this industry, then our everyday working world will be a much more positive place to be. Look out for the next video in this series and take care. Thank <laughs> you.